Well, it's time for another tutorial, and in this video, we're going to show the process of making the little silicone belly button that I've used in several of my videos. And many of you have asked about this. I did this originally a little over a year ago, and a lot of you were asking about how we made this specific section, especially those of you interested in creating your own tattoo skins. So the process for making this is actually fairly straightforward, fairly simple. Um, and it also relates to a lot of you in the special effects world and, of course, in the medical simulator world. Having a good resin mold that you can reproduce silicone parts from like this is a really good skill to know. Now, we'll be starting with our clay positive, and I'm not going to do a full breakdown of sculpting on this, just some quick tips for cleaning up a clay pattern. But we're going to take that clay pattern, and then we're going to mold it with platinum silicone. Here we have a 5130 platinum silicone mold that we're going to make of our clay positive. And we're also going to show how to check for potential cure inhibition on that pattern. It's a real important step there. Now, if we were just casting polyurethane skins or foam or whatever, we could stop at that step. But since we want the capability of casting both polyurethane skins as well as silicone skins, we're going to continue on. So the part two video is going to segue into the resin mold. And once we have that tough resin mold, which is actually less expensive to create, we can then use that to cast multiples and in fact even hundreds of copies of our little silicone belly button. And that, of course, is critical. Those of you doing uh, tattoo practice skins, medical simulators, a lot of people doing suture pads on parts like this. And we'll be using this mold later in future videos. We're going to come back to this mold and show a variety of different casting techniques for pouring different silicone parts out of this type of mold. So be sure to stay tuned for that. But we'll wrap up the video showing how to cast a basic silicone part. And again, those of you who are familiar with this process, you will immediately see all the potential for that. And then, of course, we'll also be getting into using this on a bigger scale to do bigger parts. Now I'm going to, just for time's sake, I'm going to break this up into a couple of different videos because there's a lot of knowledge to absorb here and that way we can treat these all with the detail required so you get a good understanding of the why and how of this entire chain of this process. So let's get started. Now I'm going to try to be as concise as possible, but there's a lot of information to cover in this, so if you need to, hit pause, go grab a cold drink, and come back and get ready to learn. Now to begin, we're going to be melting some monster clay in a crock pot. Here I've already got some monster clay melted down, typically on about low, that's about 175, and that's a nice consistency to start with. And as soon as I get that clay melted down and I'm ready to brush it into my life cast mold, I unplug the crock pot, and that allows that clay to gradually thicken as I'm building it up. So I'll brush in a little bit, let that cool, come back and brush a little bit more. And I'm going for a thick overall of about a uh, half inch to three quarters of an inch, even all the way up to an inch, depending on the piece that I'm making. An important detail here, you want to make sure your clay temperature is below boiling, so around 175, 185 or so. If it gets boiling or higher, what happens is if you're working with a life cast mold made of alginate, that will boil the water out of the surface of the alginate mold and cause all kinds of surface distortions. So real important to watch your clay temperature. And you see now that that clay has cooled down to the point that now it's kind of a sludge or a mud consistency and that allows us to build up that thickness really fast when it gets really nice and thick like mud. And now we're going to let that clay cast sit for a few hours and cool down. And you can even put that in a refrigerator to speed up that process. But you want that to be nice and cool so that you don't accidentally mess up your skin texture on the surface of your part. Now this is where the process gets very specific to what you're making. So here I'm just making that little rectangular belly button section and I'm using a wide putty knife to just cut off the excess clay. And for this particular part, I'm making something that could be used as both a tattoo skin or a suture pad. And I just want a nice canvas of skin texture and that belly button just so it gives some reference to what exactly this piece of skin is. And the rest of my work I'm going to do with traditional sculpting tools. But first, I'm going to put this in the fridge to cool it down a little bit more. And the reason for this is as we add fresh clay to mate this up to our baseboard, this keeps that fresh clay from sticking to the existing clay. 
and just makes it a lot easier to work with that original piece without accidentally messing up our skin texture. Now what I'm doing here is just stylizing this piece of clay so that it looks like a nice clean chunk of skin. So when we have our finished part, it looks nice around those edges and we're just cleaning that up and giving it a nice squared off edge that mates right up to that baseboard. So I'm just gonna go in with a trowel or a popsicle stick and spatula some of that clay. I'm using that warm kind of sludge consistency clay to spread around those edges and that way I don't have any gaps where that meets the baseboard. And now I'm going to use a little dental tool and you see those drips where it hit that cold clay. You don't have to worry about it sticking so you can easily pick off any drips that you get on the clay. Now everything else is pretty much traditional sculpting. I'm not going to get too much into that except it really does help to have a set of cheap nylon brushes, even a toothbrush or even some uh, softer wire brushes to clean up the little crumblies of clay and also uh, reestablish some of that skin texture. Sometimes, especially when you're doing uh, neck texture or uh, hand texture, sometimes you can get those patterns really good with those wire brushes. Now, if you have any other little rough spots in your texture, Sometimes it helps to smooth all that out with some naphtha. And if naphtha isn't available where you are, you can always use Zippo lighter fluid. That also works for this purpose. And you gotta be careful with this technique because it does soften the clay a bit. If you let it linger too much, it will soften the clay and you have to be really careful not to distort that clay surface. But this technique can be used to smooth out a lot of tooling lines and especially on areas like the sides where we want those to be nice and smooth and not look sculpted so to speak we can use that nap that to smooth out all those areas get a nice smooth clean surface but real important here once you put that on you want to be really careful not to distort the clay surface and then step back and let that dry let all that nap the flash off now at this point we have our clay pattern ready to mold and if we wanted to at this point we could skip ahead and go ahead and make our resin mold right off of this pattern and for some of you that may be the way you want to go the only downside to that approach is that does destroy our original clay pattern and also it's going to have some clay residue inside the mold that will have to be cleaned out and i'm going to get into that in a future video but having that uh clay residue to clean out that adds additional time to our process makes it a little bit messier cleanup on that final resin mold. So what we're going to do instead is now we're going to move into making a silicone mold of our clay positive. So we'll take that silicone mold and that's going to give us the ability to then proceed to making a silicone positive or a silicone pattern that we can use for our resin mold that won't leave any clay residue in our negative mold. And it also will leave us the ability at the end of this entire process, we'll have a platinum silicone mold that can be used for casting polyurethane skin materials like F105. And then we'll also have a hard resin negative mold out of TC808 that can be used for casting silicone positives. Now we're ready to pick out a silicone for our negative mold. And we want that to be a platinum silicone. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, we're going to be casting a platinum silicone positive into this mold later on. Also, if at this point we're making a mold for casting polyurethane skin materials, it's a good idea to use a platinum silicone negative because some polyurethane materials, especially the really soft materials like F105, could be inhibited by a tin cure silicone. So it just gives us a lot more casting options if we make this out of a platinum silicone. Now the BJB line of one-to-one -one silicones is really nice for this because these are all translucent one-to-one -one, low viscosity silicone systems so they could be used as both a mold material as well as a casting material. And on the top we have the really soft silicones like the 5100 or 5110 and the 5130 which is kind of a medium 25A the 40 and then the 50 which is a very firm 50 shore a and we're going to go right in the middle for this with a medium 25a the 5130 and of course the 5130 this particular system i really like this for this application because it comes in two formulas it comes in a a regular formula and a fast formula so the 5130 and then of course the 5130f or fast 
And the 5130F, that formula has about an eight minute working time and about a one to one and a half hour demold at room temperature. Even faster than that if you're working in a warmer setting. And of course the regular 5130, that's about a 30 to 40 minute working time and a three to four hour demold at room temperature. Now because we're using a platinum system, it's always a good idea to run a little test to make sure we don't have anything present that could cause cure inhibition. So I'm mixing up a small batch of the 5130F. Of course this is mixed one to one by weight or volume. And a couple of important details, what I'm going to do here for this cure inhibition test is I'm going to mix this up with some of the thickener so that it is a no sag paste, a nice thixotropic paste. And I'm also going to put a little bit of pigment in. I'm adding some white silicone pigment to this and that way I can easily see where I'm putting it. And the whole point of this is even though I don't have any obvious contaminants present, I just want to make sure this is just an extra bit of insurance. And those of you starting out work with platinum silicones, this is always good practice to do a small test against the different surfaces that you're going to be working with and make sure everything is compatible with your silicone. Because remember, it's always cheaper to find out if there's going to be an issue with 30 grams of silicone rather than three pounds of silicone. Now, Another important detail is where I apply this to do the test. The main area I want to make sure this is going to cure against is where I applied that solvent because before that solvent flashes off, sometimes that can slow down or inhibit the surface cure of the silicone. So I want to make sure where I applied that solvent that everything's going to cure okay. But I'm also applying it to the side of the piece or to a part of the piece that would be easy to clean up if we did have cure inhibition. So a real important detail to think about there is apply this to areas on your part that would be easy to clean up if, heaven forbid, you did have cure inhibition. And now we're ready to pull off that silicone and check the inside surface. And what we're looking for there is a sticky or even slimy surface. Or if you have it really bad, the silicone may not even cure at all. But this is nice and clean, so we're ready to proceed with our mold. Now this is going to be a pretty simple block mold that we're going to pour over our pattern with silicone. And I'm going to make that box with foam core board. Now you could easily use MDF or melamine coated plywood, but for this size box, foam core is really easy to work with. So I'm just bending that around into a rectangular shape and then securing that with hot glue. And more resources at the end screen. So be sure to check that out on the end screen. I'm going to have our tutorial on estimating volume. Real important information if you're just starting out making poured block molds. Now for our mold release. Real important that you use a release that does not contain silicone oil. This is ZIP301 mold release and you saw there on the can where it said non-silicone. That's an important detail because if you use a mold release that contains silicone oil, it could cause your silicone to bond to your pattern. So make sure you're always using a compatible mold release. Now I'm going to go ahead and skip ahead here. We mixed up about three and a half pounds of silicone to pour our mold and now I'm degassing it in our vacuum chamber. And this is another video that I'll link at the end screen. Vacuum degassing is important to the process anytime you know later on you're going to be pressure casting or you're just wanting to make a really nice clean mold that is completely bubble free. Because if you pour without vacuum degassing, you can still get a nice end result, but you'll still have those little micro bubbles, even with really low viscosity systems. So what I'm looking for here is I'm watching that silicone rise and then break the bubbles and fall. So once it goes to that process of where the silicone expands and then collapses, I'm ready to bleed off that vacuum and remove the silicone from my vacuum chamber. And now we're ready to pour that degas silicone over our pattern. And we're just going to pour in one corner of the box and let the silicone seek its level there. And remember that we're working with the 5130F or the fast formula. So we have a seven to eight minute working time at room temperature. And that's more than enough time to get your silicone properly mixed and vacuum degassed and poured. But time is of the essence, so make sure you get everything mixed and poured in a timely fashion. And if you need more time, you can always use that regular formula, the 5130 that has the 30 minute working time. Now this is one of the advantages to a foam core box. It's easy to just break that off of your mold and peel the mold off our pattern. And you see we got a little bit of uh, silicone creeping under the pattern, but we can cut that off with a razor knife. And now ready to open up our mold. 
And because everything was done in accordance with the prophecy, you see we have a nice clean mold and our finished clay part could be either melted down to be reused or we could archive that and use it again. And that's one of the advantages to this process. We do add a few steps, but this is a much cleaner process that allows us to retain that clay pattern if necessary and have much cleaner molds that, as you'll see in part two of this video, make the uh, second mold, the resin mold, a lot easier to work with. Now, as usual, I'll put all of the links to all the products I used in the video description, everything but the monster clay, which you can find that at a lot of art stores. But uh, all of the silicones and resins and everything will be linked in the video description, so be sure to check that out. Now, be sure to stick around for part two. Part two will cover the process of pouring up a silicone pattern and using that pattern to make a resin mold. And of course, that resin mold could be used dozens if not hundreds of times to make nice clean silicone parts for suture pads or tattoo skins or effect skins or whatever your needs require. Now on the end screen, I'll be posting links to some of our past videos related to casting silicone. So be sure to check those out. Also the volume estimating video that I mentioned earlier will be linked here. Now, as always, be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell icon so you get notified when we post new content. I'm on a schedule now that allows for a new video every Monday. So be sure to watch for our new videos every Monday. And as always, thanks for watching.